parish elders approached him on a Friday in early December, just as he knew they eventually would. Malcolm Walker had woken early that day, climbed from bed and left the parsonage, spreading salt like bird seed, the sun barely over the treetops and the roads sheeted in ice. Tuesday's snow was still banked along the glittered sidewalks, and when they were properly salted, he walked to his office and opened a bottle of white wine, a good Riesling he had been holding on to since the spring. He drank from a coffee mug, and a little after nine, stepped into the bathroom, locked the door, and vomited over a shattered urinal cake, the flat cylinder the color of frosting. When he got back to his office, the child was waiting for him. Malcolm was not surprised. The child, like the wine, had appeared in the spring, and his presence had been easily understood. Here is the incarnation of your failure. Here is the consequence of your apathy. Malcolm opened a second bottle, a jug this time, a cheap red pulled from the shelves of the Stop and Shop in Lenox. In his pocket he carried a small folded print of Grunewald's crucifixion, but did not take it out. Not yet. A little after ten, the elders arrived. He had known, of course, that they would come for him. He had considered even the composition of the group that would confront him, and knew what he would do in response. The only surprise was the suddenness of their arrival. Mr. Darton, Mr. Smiley, Dr. Zukov, led into the church by the widow Delilah, the dour and disapproving Lithuanian who had kept the parish books for thirty years. They entered solemnly, arrayed before his desk and conveying the respect he realized that was, neither, that was merited neither by his age nor his actions. Then he realized it was not so much respect as propriety, the very thing he had violated, sought to violate, in the preceding months. His church was constructed from slate, a gable roof and dormers, a 200-year-old fortress folded among the walls of fieldstone that snaked through the Berkshires. The men were equities traders and retired diplomats. The women did Pilates and talked of their, women, of their kids at Williams or Middlebury, which is to say there were certain expectations involved, rules of decorum, sumptuary practices he had failed to engage. And now was the reckoning. Mr. Smiley spoke first, kindly, Malcolm thought, of a vacation, three weeks at a clinic outside Boston, three weeks to dry out, then maybe some time alone. Mr. Smiley had a house on the Cape, nothing special, more a bungalow than anything else, but lovely, really, pushed back as it was behind the dunes. Come back a new man. Come back your old self. Malcolm's agreement seemed to please them a great deal, and he shook hands and saw them out. It was only when they were gone that he realized not one of the three had referred to him as father, and for that he was grateful. He thought it a genuine kindness. Well, he told the child when they were gone, I suppose it's time then. The child said nothing. The child said, it is time.